listen. Hi everybody, I uh, just want to say thank you for, for dialing in and this week we're joined by the fantastic Bettina Rill from uh, Melanoma Patient Network for Europe. Um, so I'll hand you over to Bettina and so Bettina would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, um, so I have met a few of you. Um, as Joe already said, uh, I founded the Melanoma Patient Network Europe, but I guess the reason, one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that by background, um, I've studied medicine in Germany and France, and I have a PhD in molecular biology. That's not quite what we're going to talk about today, but it's, it's close enough, so it, it's also about genes um, and uh, genetic information. And I started MPNE after losing my husband to cutaneous melanoma. Um, in 2012 and uh, actually quite from very much from the beginning we had a few uveal patients among us and uh, we as you know uh, uveal melanoma is genetically distinct and behaves differently from cutaneous melanoma and we had a few patients here and there and we didn't really know how to support them appropriately so we developed a strategy over time how to do this better and I think we're, we're slowly getting there it's never fast enough but um, so we have kind of now developed a, a co-network because uh, and we're now doing this also for other rare melanomas. You will know that you're not the only rare melanoma. So there's uveal melanoma, there's acral, there's mucosal, there's pediatric, there are even ultra rare forms. And uh, the way we work it is that we train the entire cutaneous network to recognize these rare melanomas. Because what happened at the beginning is that someone signed up into a network. They didn't sometimes even didn't really know that they had something like uveal melanoma. And then it took ages before they was, were pointed in, uh, towards the right direction. And we try to change that. So we try to educate the entire network to recognize what is a rare melanoma and then to know where to point these patients. So we basically use a larger network as a fishing net to get to these patients faster because I don't believe it is feasible um, to build for every small tiny entity an own network that acts independently and then get people to their own time. So I think it's a bit, it's a, you know, a mix of two words and so far it has working quite well. So we had, uh, some of you were there last uh, autumn in, uh, in Berlin, we had a first conference, um, and well not first, but an mp &E rare conference. So we put them together because there's quite a bit of overlap between the different types of melanoma. And it's kind of good to see what's going on in one because often one can extrapolate and can maybe use drugs that are used for one condition for the next. So why I'm here today, and I start with an apology, uh, my time schedule today was totally out of the window, um, so I do this uh, on the fly more or less, but Joe asked me to explain a few genetic terms that come up um, again and again uh, in your journal club, and um, because it's, uh, it's close to what I've done in my professional life in the past, I'm very happy to do that. Um, I would like, however, to start, uh, do you, Joe, do you want me to go straight into your list of hate terms or yes, <laughs> yes okay so uh, first i would like to say something first i would like to start with uh, how i'm impressed uh, i am with you all starting this journal club and really sticking to it um journal journals reading journal clubs or reading scientific papers is a part of academic culture so anyone who works in science does this all the time or should be doing it all the time and journal clubs are what you start well to get introduced to usually as a student or as a phd student it's usually just like you it's a weekly gathering where the entire group meets to discuss a paper very much like you do this now um i am a paper person so that's why i wanted to show you that i still do these um i used to have many more piles i try to get a bit more organized uh, so i try to read online but i'm actually quite a, a paper person so this yes you can maybe see it says organ specific no you can't because it's in reverse but it says organ specific immunity so this is some reading i've done for last year's esmo session that i organized there's something about human heterogeneity in there so good papers that are kind of the basic I come back to again and again and then I like to have a paper copy that's annotated with my thoughts on there um, because then it's just easier to remember and I don't particularly enjoy reading on the screen so I do print trees and all that uh, right uh, I do print the important papers out um, something to uh, how a bit how I read the paper because I think that's the kind of um, important one and getting started is the very very hard bit because the first thing is how do you choose a paper what is relevant and what should you be reading and what shouldn't you be reading 
especially at the beginning, I think it's worth reading a lot and rather skimming through them instead, a bit like learning a foreign language where you don't want to go word by word by word, trying to understand every single bit, but trying to get the gist of it. I think it's a better starting point. How I usually work is, so this is one of my favorite papers, actually, um, if you can see it, I tend to mark things that are relevant to me. I will have annotations often on the back. And when you go through, you often see that there are references in there. You won't see this because I hadn't figured out or I hadn't considered that it would be reversed, but you see then the references. What I do is I go to, every time I see something like, oh, this is interesting, I will mark it. I'm not sure whether I've done it in this paper, but usually in my annotations, I will mark in the references the ones that I think are relevant and take this for the next reading round. So link them all together and start reading in a kind of, think of it in an environment. You will very fast, you will realize that there is just a limited um, number of papers. At the beginning it seems a huge heap, but in reality that's not true. You will see that this, the same things are referenced over and over again. And once you get bored by that, you know that you have covered what you is to supposed to be there. Of course, if you keep the topic very vague, you will never get there. But if you keep it specific enough, you'll find there are there is a handful of papers. And once you see, yeah, been there, done that, read that, then you know you've read enough. So I think that's the kind of where to go through. So skimming is important, trying to get the gist, don't get hung up on details. Check out the references and try to get a mapping, like a feeling for the area then you're on top of it. And then you can move to the next. And often it automatically comes like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And then you move to the next step. Okay. So today, what I'm gonna to talk to you doing today is um, about DNA, because the list of things that, um, of terms that uh, Joe sent me were all linked to DNA and the specific ways um, cancer messes up DNA. And that's actually, well, fascinating on one side, but it's also important because it has something to do with prognostication. If you want to take a very, very high level view, the entire list that Joe sent me with point mutations, aberrations, monosomies, duplications, any type of that is a way how DNA is wrong in cancer. Any aspect independently as such is linked to a prognosis or a prognostic, it's a called a prognostic factor. So a patient with a tumor with this specific thing will have certain clinical behavior. And that's the level I think you should be thinking of it. Take it as a list of items independent of what they are. And we're gonna go into what they are in a second, but think of them as A, B, C, D, label them whatever you want, because you probably, at the, one of the important things, and I think where you pick this paper is the prognostication in there. So if I have this type of combination of genetic mod like modifications, this is what it means as a patient for me. So I think that's a very important level for you to keep before getting lost in detail, because in the end, it does not really matter whether it's a point of mutation or a loss or a monosomy, because it is important because of what it means for us clinically. So that is a very, very important general level. It's important to understand because you will have a patient coming to you and they couldn't care less about the genetics. They're desperate. They will have a report and it will say, blah, 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 aberration and you should have an opinion on it. But it's not really important what that really is. You want to understand that this is correlated with a certain clinical feature, and that clinical feature means, for example, that this is a patient who should be having more scans than someone else. That is the bit that is relevant for us because that's where we save the lives. So the rest is nice to know and important if you want to design research studies or you want to comment on research protocols. That's when the clinical side, the, the, the scientific side matters. To understand or say, what should I be doing? It's much less relevant, yeah? So that, 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 that distinction is, is, is clear and important and should be for everyone. Um, a big part of what we do as patient advocates is actually education and teaching. And this, the, finding the right level of abstraction is super, super important. Because if you get lost to the, in detail very fast, and it, it happens very, very easily, as soon as one starts reading, it becomes common knowledge and you start using it and it becomes part of your language. Just the next person arriving hasn't been doing that reading and then you lose these people there. So you have to think about knowledge in terms of, I think of them as layers. What's the most abstract and the bare essentials? And then you can go deeper. Okay, so I hope that was clear. Now, now we come to the messed up DNAs. Okay, I'm not sure how much you know about DNA. 
So DNA is the code that makes life in a way. Like computer code is zero and one. We have something that's way fancier, I think. It's called the genetic code. It's also a bit more complex and it's tiny, tiny because every cell contains it. Every single cell of our body has the full genetic code. So every single cell has the full information to make a full copy of us, which I think just thinking about it is pretty, pretty cool. Now, we're, I don't want to go too deep, um, also because of time and everything, but we want to get to the messed up bit. So if you think about this, and I've tried to find props that you are going to remember. So you're going to remember this. So DNA has two strands. They don't hang up like this. Just thinking about this in a cell would be quite messy. So the cell has found ways how to tidy things. The first thing is that it wraps it up. That's the double helix that you will have seen. And then you can twist the double helix where this model already falls apart um, in a way to compact the DNA. That's, however, not the only way, because you can imagine if you do this still, if you wrap it, you're going to end up with something. I asked my kids to give me a messy piece of wool in the house. We always have these heaps of entangled stuff, but now they're all sorted out, maybe because of COVID, but usually, you know, that we have some wool that someone, you know, started and never got around. Um, so that's way too tidy. But that's what DNA would look like without a higher order of principle. Uh, I don't know uh, who of you got uh, taught how to knit. Uh, I got taught how to knit uh, when I was a kid. And one of the first things I got told is you don't start knitting like this, you make a nice little roll out of it. So there's a principle how you do it and I never get it really nice, but it should be doing something like this, right? It's usually not very elegant. So the DNA doesn't do that. The DNA has found a principle how to organize it. And you're gonna remember this because I found the most ridiculous part in my household. So I'm sure you know what these are. So in DNA terms, this is called a histone. What happens is that the DNA is wrapped around this histone and not just one, but the next histone on top, and it will go this way. And it will continue forever. And you can imagine you'll have lots of this green stuff with these histones that you wrap. It's a type of packaging unit of DNA. And you can even control this further and compact it even further. Why this is interesting and relevant because it also comes in the melanoma. No, I don't know where I put my nice clip with. So if you knit, you start knitting at one end, you can access the, the entire piece by one end or the other. So you have two access points to your wall. DNA needs more access than that because the DNA encodes all the information to make all the important proteins we have. So think of it, you want to start knitting in lots of places at the same time, which is impossible if you package it like this. If you have packaged it in such a way, however, it is possible to access the piece of DNA you're after. What you do is you just simply roll it a little bit and then all of a sudden, ta -da -ta, this bit becomes accessible and you can close it again. Some parts of DNA, and that's why I had a paper clip here, is you want to lock away. That's like the forbidden section in the library, if you've read Harry Potter, where you're not supposed to go. So I put now a clip, I found my clip again, I put a clip here. So if you try to open this section, it will not allow it. That section is locked away and cannot be opened and cannot be accessed. So anything that is written on here, as which you know exactly what it says and being in Europe, cannot be read. These paper clips are of course not paper clips in DNA, they're called epigenetics. There are epigenetic markers, that is genetic information, the green is genetic, is the gene. Epi means next, epigenetic is the information on the green the paper clip on the green that locks pieces of DNA away and makes them inactive. That's important because that's actually one of the things that cancer does. It steals paper clips. Not just kids steal paper clips, also cancer steals paper, paper clips. That means that all of a sudden, the cancer can access parts of the genomes that it should not be accessing normally. For example, programs to grow wildly to migrate around the body and do things that it's usually not supposed to do, like producing enzymes to digest everyone around them. 
So it's part of the genome that are important in certain points in development, but then get locked away because if they're not controlled, they kind of become very, very dangerous. And so if you read next time anything about epigenetics, this time there was nothing in there, but I know you have some research ongoing about epigenetics, that's epigenetics. Parts of the genome that are safely controlled and locked away by epigenetic markers, you lose them, that's a typical thing of cancer, and that's why epigenetic modifiers are used in cancer therapy. Now, so this kind of entire packaging, you imagine now like compacted, compacted, and compacted again. And usually you have this mass of DNA in the cell at all times with these little nucle uh, nucleus or like histones on there. Uh, a nucleosome, that's why I sometimes use the term, is a histone. So one of these nice pink ones with one round of DNA around it is called a nucleosome. In the cell, the DNA, you have them sliding back and forth, opening the bits they're allowed, not opening the hidden parts of so the locked libraries. If a cell then starts to grow and divide, so makes more cells, like I mean hair, for example, skin are cells that divide frequently, it's impossible to just, you can't just chop this mess into parts and put it in cells. What happens is that all of a sudden our cells nicely condense up in so-called chromosomes. I could just share the screen because I put something up or just paint something for easier. Can you see, see this? So this is what we always see as chromosomes. Can you see that? It's just an X basically. Yeah. Okay. So usually chromosomes look like this. Okay, I made it longer because chromosomes have a short arm, that's the short arm and the long arm. So these things are called arms. A chromosome like this, and we humans have 23 of these X's if you want, are the way to organize the DNA because what then happens is when the cell divides, you can neatly pluck them apart and every cell will get one copy of it. So this will go to one side, and this will go to the other side, and this will be cell A, and this will be cell B. The point that this is cell A, this is cell B. This is called the centromere, and this is the way this entire thing is organized. Every, this is a very important point because it nicely aligns what is called, this is called a centromere. Uh, so this is quite, this is uh, this is this is the centromere. This is the chromosome. This is the short arm. They are also called. Don't ask me. I knew that at some point. They are called P. And the other long ones are called Q. You might already recognize that from your descriptions, because you will have seen that I think it is an eight Q gain that you will have found in uveal melanoma. Because what can happen is that normally when cell nicely divides, it should be every cell gets part of it, should get one P and one Q. Sometimes funny things happen and the division will go like this or will go like this. That means then that one cell will have two short arms and one long arm and the other one will have one less. And this is the way how you can produce monosomies and trisomies. It basically means that when the, when, the, when the chromosome aligns and gets split off between two daughter cells, the cells, the chromosome does not nicely split between the two cells, but unevenly. And this is then where you have some cells that have too much information and the others that have too little information. And depending on what happens to these cells, because most of these cells that have too much or too little die because they miss something that's important. Unfortunate for us, some of them are able to survive. And they are the ones that are causing us trouble. Because this, of course, is not just a piece of random information. This DNA contains information. And this information is not just what a cell is supposed to produce, but also when it is supposed to produce them, under which circumstances. So it is both what plus the control switches. Now imagine, I don't know, I have a good example for um, how this works. So um, give me something where you have like, okay, so you have like, you, um, you just have a very small water kettle. So your water kettle just fits about a pint of water. It's one of these travel ones. Now, 
you have 10 people coming over for tea you will see that you have a problem right because there's only so much you can do with this one water kettle so you know a pint would be maybe a nice one for a travel if you just want to have a quick cup of coffee or tea but it's not good for a big party so you know it's kind of the rate limiting step you would need to have it a lot so that would be annoying so the as the water kettle all of a sudden is where the water kettle defines how much you can have or make tea in a reasonable amount of time now imagine all of a sudden you don't have one but you have two or you have five of these small water kettles all of a sudden the problem is gone away and you can make much more tea in the same amount of time this happens exactly if you duplicate dna if you have more of the dna you can produce more of the same thing in the same amount of time because you get more instructions more open dna and will produce more now imagine this is one of these things that tells the cell to grow and that's usually what happens in cancer if we all of summer have a trisomy there's something in there that gives the cells properties that make it dangerous for us. So it's too much of information allows the cells to do things more than it usually does. The same thing, of course, if you lose your water kettle, you'll have a problem making tea at all. So a loss reduces the amount of information that a cell has. And often it is a so-called tumor suppressor. These are kind of things that are controlling. And you can imagine loss of a control means the, un the, the, the thing gets out of control. So it can be too much of something that drives, like an oncogene, so that drives cancer. It can be loss of an inhibitor. So that's why losing entire parts of this genome is so important or so critical for us. You often don't just, I mean, we lose an entire part of the chromosome. There's not just one gene. It's an entire chain of genes. And that sometimes one has combinations of effects. It's usually one that is dominant, so that is very, very driving the effect of what we see. But of course, the cell has lost all the information in there. So it's an entire chunk. And you can have this also in, you know, genetic, like when children are born, you can have genetic losses. Uh, what we call like Down syndrome is a trisomy 21. So where you basically have three copies, it's a similar thing. You have too much of something and that then causes issues. So that is when you have like a monosomy or a trisomy or like, a, like an entire part of the genome after a cell division gone wrong is too much or too little. What then can happen is instead of basically having an entire arm of the chromosome that is affected, what can happen also is that chromosomes have genetic parts that look quite similar in parts. And what happens is that they can go together and then things can flip. So you can have, this is called a translocation, where one part of the genome ends up on the, another part of the genome. This is not a random process. Some, there is some randomness in there, but there are kind of something like breaking points, pre-designed breaking points, where DNA preferentially likes to swap over. If you think, for example, of CML, so I'm sure you know Jan Geisler and the CML community. So that is, they have a, something that is called a Philadelphia chromosome, where something like this just happens, where it's a bit, you know, like, I mean, I don't know what they call it in English, actually, you know, these kind of moppets, you know, these little electric things you think on, that the teenagers then tweak to make them go really fast, to put it some turbo on there, to tweak the engine. That's a little bit what happens in translocation. So you take your little moped, but then you give it something that it shouldn't be having. And that's what CML has, basically. So that's when parts of genomes get put together that don't belong together. Usually some type of enzyme that in its own is harmless, but then gets a turbo put on, and then, for example, loses control or cannot be switched off anymore. So that can happen as well. Bits of pieces moving around. And then you can have, so you can have either a part of, you can either lose an entire chromosome, you can lose an arm of a chromosome, you can lose a piece of a chromosome, and what you can then also have are so-called point mutations. A point mutation is one piece of the DNA is wrong. One single piece. And you think, I mean, we have so much of it. Does that really matter? Well, often it doesn't matter because it sits somewhere where it has no direct impact. But it's like, you know, you have this tiny, tiny little stone in your shoe and it really, really, really bugs you and you get blisters afterwards and it bleeds and can knock you out for days that you can't walk properly. So you think, how can this stupid little stone have such an effect? It's a bit like this. So it's something tiny in the right or well, wrong, depending how you see it, place, can have huge effect. 
In melanoma, that would be the BRF mutation, where a single base pair exchange leads to a protein that is totally different from what or has changed its function in a way that makes it dangerous for the person. How does that happen? Well, I said we are more sophisticated than computer code, right? Computer code has two stages, on, off. We have first four base pairs, so we can already be more complex. And how this then works is that four base pairs in a certain way lead to a certain instruction, which part, and think of it as, actually, that's what I've wanted to get, Lego blocks, tell you, you take this type of Lego block and put it in this place. So a protein is basically little Lego blocks and always three base pairs in, 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 like in a triplet tell you, take a yellow one, take three, you know, the three ones in yellow. And the next one is a four in blue. And then there's some little hooks and you build a chain based on these instructions. Very much as some colors, you know, whether you take one that is the typical one, the classic one where we have four times two, like the eight one, whether it's blue or red or green makes an aesthetic difference, but it doesn't change your house or anything you want to build. But just imagine everyone knows then you don't have the right size, it's the wrong size and all of a sudden nothing fits properly together. This is exactly what happens with point mutations. It's something like messing up, up your Lego blocks and then you end up with a protein that either makes no sense at all or that has lost the off switch as with the BRAF. And depending on, that is very much dependent and that's, I mean, we can take this another time uh, because aberrations just means all of it together and we can maybe go another time in detail through what happens if you change it that way or if you change it another way because there are lots of different things that can happen. But just to think about it, one point mutation can be like the stone in your shoe. It can make your life really, really miserable because depending on where it sits, it can have disastrous consequences to the protein. It can either lose to what is called a frame shift as in basically you can't read the instructions at all anymore. There's just nonsense coming out. So you end up with something that has no function. You can have something with an altered function like the BRF protein that cannot be switched off anymore. You have sometimes things that cannot be switched on anymore. So it can be very specific functions. Um, and there are some other ways how you kind of can mess up a protein that is non-functional anymore. The end result is always something that either functions incorrectly, so cannot be switched on or off mainly, or something that is nonsense. Depending on where that point mutation is, you can imagine, because DNA has a direction, right? You know exactly when you're supposed to put this over your neck, what you put over your neck and what you don't put over your neck. So if you think that this is the start of a protein and this is the end of a protein, you can imagine, um, and I'm not gonna do this now because we don't have that so, so many, just imagine you have a, a so-called frame shift mutation that anything past it is rubbish. Just imagine I cut here, so like this you kind of have a protein that kind of still looks very much like the linear, like before you just miss a little bit. If the important bit is sitting here, you're even not gonna notice that you lost something. If I, however, have the same thing and imagine the problem starts here and you're gonna lose everything here. So you imagine now the thing, all the protein you got left looks like this then you lost the important bit that did you, the job for you. So the position of this is important. But all of this would be called point mutations or aberrations and are often grouped, especially if it's not a specific position. BRAF has the V600E as the most uh, like specific one. That's a very specific point in this entire thing. But some proteins can have messes all over and then it depends on where it sits, how it affects. So you can, that's why you can have people with mutations in the same gene have very different phenotypes because depending on where the mutation sits, it has a different effect. So that's why it's important to understand whether there's a mutation that always sits in the same spot where you can expect the outcomes to be the same or whether it's one of those that can go everywhere where you can expect some variability in the outcome. Okay, so to go back to the top level, DNA is the genetic information for our cells. All, every cell has the full information to make a full human being. Lots of the parts of our DNA are, are however not read, but locked away. And only the parts that let's say a liver cell or a hair cell or a skin cell 
needs are read from the DNA. So most of the DNA is never read in that very specific cell. Epigenetic modifiers make sure that parts of the genome are locked away. Cancer is able to mess up a lot of the genome because of what it's called genetic instability. For example, enzymes that control DNA quality, like the quality control of our, of our cells that is usually very, very strong, is something cancer cells often lose. And that then loses too, Let's, leads to the loss of paper clips. So they can open parts of the genome, they can access programs that they shouldn't be having access to. And because this control mechanism is not very much, not so well in place anymore, what happens is that the DNA gets altered and there are certain ways how it can break. So you can have, when a cell division happens and usually the DNA first gets duplicated and then split evenly between the two daughter cells, something goes wrong in that process and you can have either full chromosomes going to, both chromosomes going to one side, or you can have parts of chromosomes going to one side instead of the other, too much or too many, which then leaves you with imbalanced daughter cells. Often that's a competitive disadvantage and these cells will die, but sometimes in certain conditions it can be a competitive advantage and these are the cells that will grow and cause more trouble. In addition to what cancer cells can do is they can swap parts of the genome can change places between chromosomes where they're not belong. If one is unlucky, one creates tuned mopeds, which one does not want in a normal cell. So that's a translocation where, or you can have also reversals that flip that the parts of DNA, for example, flip, similar effect. And then you can have single point mutations and there are certain conditions like UV light or cigarette smoke that are famous for inducing single like point mutations. So single DNA breaks that then lead to point mutations. Point mutations can be totally irrelevant, depending if they sit in a, in a space that has no control, but they can be also de detrimental. And I described a little bit what happens depending on the place in the, in the protein, what can happen that the protein either just becomes totally jumbled and is non-functional, or that it gains functions or loses functions that it needs. Something I haven't mentioned is that you can obviously also mutate the switches of the gene. So the cancer does not know which part of the genome it is allowed or is supposed to mutate. So you can, for example, also make on switches stronger or you can lose off switches. So that's something that can happen in addition to that. I think I covered the principles that you gave me in the list. Absolutely. Questions? <laughs> Can I kick that off? Sure. Um, and, and everyone, you feel free to unmute yourselves uh, for this part if you've got any questions. You know, on your diagram that you drew with the long yeah. X, so where you had the curve, yeah. would, that, would that cell that comes off that be the daughter cell that you refer to? Both the daughter to? cells. You don't have a proper, afterwards you can't tell. So what happens is like cells kind of duplicate the DNA and they make more of everything. Like, so they become big blobs okay. and then they align their, their chromosomes. And then you have like this process where the cell in the middle ties up. But afterwards you have two daughter cells. So you can't really say, you know, that's the parent and that's the daughter. You just have messed up cell. It's always called daughter cells. Okay. But you have a messed up cell if it hasn't divided as it should have done. Well, you'll have two messed up cells, right? Because one has okay, too much, yep. one has too little. So just yep. what I said, sometimes, usually messed up DNA is a disadvantage. So these cells will die. They either, they're either commit suicide, which is called apoptosis, or they get killed by the immune system. So the body is usually very intolerant of, of messed up DNA because it is so dangerous. And the cancer we see is basically messed up cells that escape the control of the body. That's the cancer we see because the other ones get, you know, cleared off before. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask? Okay, I'll have one more then. Sure. Would you mind letting everybody know about somatic and germline mutations? Sure. Okay. Please, so. Thank you. You'll probably explain it better than I did. Okay, so um, I'm sure you remember that time in biology when they started with bees and flowers. Um, that part was a lie. Uh, but you will remember that every human being starts with a fertilized egg. 
So we all get half of our DNA from our mother, and that sits in the lower side, so the XL, and the other half from our father. Give or take mitochondria from the mother, so it's a little bit more mom than father, but let's not be too, you know, it's not, it's not the time for splitting hairs in that respect right now. So once combined, we end up with a full set. So we get basically 23 halves from mom, 23 halves from dad, together that makes 23 us, okay? So this is everything from there, as I said, cells divide and become to daughter cells. And then what can, sometimes they can go different ways, but this is how a cell will grow. And this is how this first oocyte, actually or the fertilized egg divides. So it doubles everything, separates, doubles, separates, doubles, separates, and that goes again and again and again. Now you can imagine if something goes wrong at that early point, or let's say your mom or your father has a mutation that is already sitting there when you kind of, when the, in the first, very first step, every single copy of it will have that mistake. It's like, you know, the old days with photocopy machines, if you, you know, pulled, you stood there and you did 100 copies of something, if you had a mistake in the first time, it will be in all the 100 copies. That's exactly what a germline mutation is because it went through the germline. So it went through the germ cells, your parents' germ cells. Something that goes wrong at that level will then always call, it will be called a germline mutation. It can also sometimes happen that neither the parents have it, but something happens spontaneously in the very early stages of embryogenesis. And that's also called a germline mutation. That basically means that every single cell of the adult will have a mutation. And you could take, let's say, a cell from my skin, from my hair, from anywhere from my body, and they would all have that very same mutation. That is classic for cancer predisposition syndromes, for fam familiar forms of cancer, where everyone in the family has that again and again. And if when we, when we have these families where there is lots of the same cancer coming again and again and again, and we have some like these BAP1 families, where every member of these families, or like a large proportion of the members of the family has this mutation, that's when you should be doing genetic analyses and family analyses and family trees to see who's affected and where you should have extensive gen genetic testing to pick up people who are at a high risk of getting the cancer because that is then what allows you to screen the next and hopefully discover it earlier. So that's a germ limitation, and those are where you have these family pedigrees where you can say, okay, you know, this sits in the family. Something else, and it's important to know the difference, is a so-called so -called somatic mutation. So very frequent in cutaneous melanoma, but it can also happen in ocular melanoma, is that the mutation happens in the tumor or in some early tumor cells that then become the cancer that starts causing problems. That mutation can only be found in that tumor so if you took a cell, let's say a hair cell, or you know, DNA from anywhere outside the tumor, it will not have the mutation. If you take the DNA from the tumor, it will have the mutation. That's called somatic mutation. Why is that important? It's important for two things. Well, more than two things. So the first one is if you want to sample it, if you want to find that mutation, for a germline mutation, you can take any sample. You can take blood, you could take hair. Hair is not very popular because it's not so easy to get DNA out of hair because I mean, these are dead cells, so it's not so easy to take out. That's why people like blood because it's, you know, it's easy to get, you know, you don't have to cut or anything. Well, you, you take blood, but it's still less invasive than other ways. So a germline mutation, you can identify in any piece of, of, of body tissue. It, something, a somatic mutation, you have to biopsy the tumor and you actually have to make sure that you biopsy the tumor. And that's not so obvious because if the tumor is small and surrounded by lots of healthy tissue, if you poke a little bit next to it, you will not find it, though it's still there because you didn't poke the tumor. So it's really important when it comes to sampling and biopsies. Often actually what people now do today is do both, look in the tumor and the blood because then you can say you can distinguish because if you just poke into the tumor, you can't tell whether this is just a somatic mutation, so just in the tumor, or whether it's everywhere. Because sometimes it is relevant, so that's why they will look at both and then compare. So you can say these mutations are somatic, so just found in the tumor, these are germline, these are everywhere in the body. So that's important to keep apart because one of the questions that people or patients often have is, can my children inherit this? 
If you have a germ limitation, uh, there's a high risk that children will inherit it, 50%, because usually we have one mutated copy that then gets split in our germ cells. So that means 50% of my eggs will have it, the other 50 won't. So 50% of my offspring will have it, the other 50 won't. Well, if it's a somatic mutation, you don't pass this on. You can obviously, I mean, for us, it's just like, and there's some overlap with your real melanoma is fair skin, like blue eyes, blonde hair, fair skin types, confer a higher risk for melanomas in general. So you, there is an, a genetic factor in there, of course, but you do not pass on that but one mutation or that BREF mutation because it's a somatic mutation. So it's something that happens later after your body is fully formed and just in the tumor area. It's a super important concept because often people say, you know, oh my God, you know, like I'm a mutant. So, you know, my kids will get it. So, and it's an important concept to, to be able to explain as well, because it can, you know, keeps, you know, gives, it's just like, it reassures people. Brilliant. Thank you. So if somebody has a certain mutation in their primary tumor and then they develop metastatic disease, I understand that they do differ. So not all tumors then follow the primary tumor, do they? Yes. But is there, is there any similarities between the two? Yes, I know. So both is very much dependent to um, first it, you know, we poke into a tumor and it depends a little bit on how you look at the mutations. If you do a PCR, it will, you'll have a yes, no. Um, most tumors are not a homogeneous mass. So it's not one thing that we're looking at. We call it, we think of a tumor as one thing. It's not. It's a group of tumor cells. They're all nasty, but they're nasty in different ways. So some of them, so already from the starting point, that mutation might not be shared among all the nasty guys. It might be just some of the nasty guys have it and others don't have it. So tumor heterogeneity is a very, very important concept to start with. Because sometimes what happens is that we put a therapy on top that preferentially kills off certain type of cells, but not others. So if it, your therapy preferentially kills off cells with a certain mutation, you create a perfect niche for all the other nasty gangsters that don't have the mutation. So in that case, you would expect a metastasis not to have the mutation. So then cancer is a moving target. The cancer you have a diagnosis is not the one that you have in a metastatic stage. They linked because they have shared family history, but think of it like, you know, I mean, how much do you have in common with your grandfather? You're the same family, but there's a lot of change over time. And that's because we, you know, something happens to us, we live differently, so it's the exposure. So one has to think of tumors as a mixed bag of things that in addition undergoes evolution. So it is possible that you find mutations that are shared in the sense of, and this is, I don't get it wrong, but in the sense of a germline, so a tumor germline. So every, it was there the first nasty one and then it's shared across. But you can also find these new events that happen on top of everything. And you can have, in addition, the heterogeneity. So if your tumor was highly heterogeneous, not all cells have imitation. Of course, you cannot expect every offspring to have it. So there can be both. Usually what happens is that you have okay. some shared mutations that go across, like a link, like a family tradition of the nasty type, in addition to new alterations. And it's these new alterations. Remember I said cancer cells? are unstable, the genome is not very well controlled, so they tend to accumulate more mutations and get nastier over time, over time, over time. So you would expect shared mutations across the entire lineage of the tumor, but expect the offspring to get nastier over time and accumulate more rubbish as they go along. Fantastic, brilliant. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we have a question. We have Hi. a hand raised. Yeah, <clears throat> along the line of what you've just said, why inocular melanoma then on really early tumours can you find that people have already got metastases, whereas you're saying it get na gets nastier over time on, you know, fairly small tumours, you can still already have metastases. Yeah, well, because, you know, the, the, there is, so the process is stochastic, so there is some randomness to it. Everything we say is true for a certain degree of patients. 
there are two things that make a tumor, like make cancer, cancer. And I always compare this to, you know, you are, imagine you're on a plane. There are two types of, well, there are a number of passengers you don't want to have, but there are two particular fellow passengers that are really annoying. The ones getting on there and not knowing where their place is and then just migrating and moving their stuff and going there and then sit on your place and then you go with a ticket and say you're sitting on my place. That's one of the annoying ones. And then the other ones, you know, I'm sure you sit somewhere and then they start spreading, kind of, you know, invading your space. Mm -hmm. That's the second type. Cancer is just like that. Normally a cell, a proper cell, knows where to sit. They know their place. And they stay in their place. They don't infringe on others and they don't pop around. They stay where they are. Cancer loses these two properties. The first one is the sitting in place is the migration. Cancer cells are migratory. So they have lost this. Um, they have something, you know, it's like this, like this Velcro that makes these things stick. Stick, you imagine they stick. So cells have Velcro that attaches them to their seats and that, that they stay there. Cancer cells lose this Velcro and then migrate through the body. That's metast metast metastasis. And then they start spreading. So they grow bigger than they allow to uh, infringe on the neighbors. And some start even destroying the neighbors around them. I mean, usually fellow passengers aren't that rude, but these are the two properties. One, so one is called metastasis. The other one is called destructive growth. These are driven by certain genetic signals, like loss of the Velcro, or being able to produce certain enzymes. And that event, if you're unlucky, can happen very, very early on in tumor formation. So you can have metastasis very early on. Usually there's a correlation, the bigger the tumor, the more mets, just because the likelihood of one of the guys, of the nasty gangsters acquiring this property goes up. But if you're unlucky, you have very few tumor cells, but one got this bit, and then you have metastasis. So all about this is about stochasticity. So it's about, there is a random element to it. So there will never be absolute certainty that if your tumor is that small, you will never have metastasis. It will, we will never be able to do that. That's the hope about this genetic analysis, because if we